Hey everyone, it's Beverly Hallberg. Welcome to a special pop-up episode of She Thinks, your favorite podcast from the Independent Women's Forum where we talk with women and sometimes men about the policy issues that impact you and the people you care about most. Enjoy. Hi everyone. I'm Patrice Anwuga, Senior Policy Analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. Welcome to a special pop-up episode of She Thinks, your favorite podcast from the Independent Women's Forum, where we talk with women and occasionally men about the policy issues that impact you and the people you care most about. Joining us today is Jim Manley, an attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation, to discuss the latest on AB5, the job-killing law that is wreaking havoc on freelancers across the state and serves as a model for other states as well as the nation. As a reminder, AB5 forces companies in the state to reclassify most freelancers as employees. Now, Jim litigates in defense of free speech, economic liberty, and property rights. For more than a decade, he has been fighting to protect and expand freedom through strategic litigation and policy making. But before joining Pacific Legal, Jim litigated at the Goldwater Institute and the Mountain States Legal Foundation. He lives in Phoenix with his wife, Marlene, and their kids, Milton and Cora. And I understand they have a dog named Dolly Madison and a cat named Martha Washington. Jim, welcome to She Thinks. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Terrific. I'm sure we'll circle back at the end about Martha Washington and Dolly Madison, but uh, let's get to the important stuff of the day. So tell us more about the Pacific Legal Foundation. You know, why was your organization created and what do you do there? Well, Pacific Legal Foundation is the oldest uh, public interest legal foundation dedicated to litigating for individual rights. And so we, we file lawsuits all over the country uh, fighting for property rights, economic liberty, uh, fighting against government overreach in environmental regulations, uh, and also fighting for free speech. And uh, that is really what brought us into this fight over AB5, uh, because in addition to being really bad economic policy, uh, AB5 also has uh, significant constitutional problems uh, under the First Amendment because of the way it treats uh, freelance writers uh, and photographers. Gotcha. Well, we're going to get into that in a moment. Um, but just for everybody's sake who's listening, um, you know, right now the state of play is that a legislative attempt to repeal AB5 has failed, including one that happened last week. Um, we've got legal challenges like the one from the organization that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, so those are still up in the air. And then we've got this ballot initiative uh, called Prop 22 to exempt ride-sharing drivers from AB5. So there, there are still some different local trains running on different tracks related to AB5, but that is the current state of play. And now even more current, uh, Jim, is something that happened on the final day of session on Monday. Tell us what the California legislature has do- just done regarding AB5. Yeah, so a little bit of background will help put this into context. The way AB5 works is if if you are a a freelancer and the work that you're doing is in the usual course of the hiring entity's business, then you basically can't be an independent contractor. So if you're a freelance writer working for a newspaper, um, your work as a writer is in the usual course of that newspaper's business, and so you're not allowed to be a freelancer. Now, that's a terrible policy because um, many of our clients members, we represent the American Society of Journalists and Authors and the National Press Photographers Association. Many of their members have been making successful careers as freelancers for decades. And the same goes for folks who rent a chair in a barber salon and, and cut hair or, or someone who does nails in a similar manner um, or even a, a freelance uh, lawyer who does contract work for a firm all sorts of independent contractors working, thriving in California and across the country. And California imposes this rule in AB5 that says, no, you're not allowed to be a freelancer if your work is the same work as as your clients. But because that's such a bad policy, uh, the legislature realized that even as they were debating AB5. And so they enacted all of these exemptions. There were something like 50 exemptions in AB5 itself for various types of, of workers who 
would still be allowed to freelance, even though um, the, the, the AB5 tries to ban the, the practice. And so what happened on Monday was um, what, what was in, inevitable. When the legislature starts carving out exemption after exemption, it's going to miss some people. And it missed a whole bunch of people. And this bill that was, that was passed by the legislature, uh, AB 2257, adds about two dozen more exemptions to AB 5. So we're, we're well on our way to 100 exemptions uh, to this horrible policy. And um, uh, some of those exemptions help our clients, uh, but there are many, many freelancers in California who even after Monday are either left out completely uh, or left sort of in a gray area and they're not really sure if, if they're, they're free to freelance in California. Well, talk about your clients and, and your uh, the lawsuit. I mean, you, you guys sued on behalf of the American Society of Journalists um, and authors uh, and the National Press Photographers Association. So tell us about the lawsuit and, you know, what and, and also broadly talk about the different treatment, the unequal treatment of content creation in AB5. I mean, the difference between writers and people who do photography or graphic arts. Yeah, and so, yeah, we represent the American Society of Journalists and Authors and the National Press Photographers Association, and they have hundreds of members in California alone uh, who have made thriving careers as, as freelance writers and, and photographers. Many of them uh, have chosen the independent freelance path because they've had a terrible experience working in an office, in the office environment, or being beholden to one, one employer, and they like the freedom and flexibility of being in charge of their own client base and, and being able to say no to a client if, if that client is difficult or if they just need to take the time to care for a relative or, or focus on some other issue. Freelancing gives them that flexibility, and AB5 threatened to take that away. Uh, now, AB5 did provide an exemption for journalists, but as you've hinted at, it, it provided a, an unequal exemption. So there was this big long list of professional services that, were, that are exempt under AB5, and, and you can still freelance uh, if you're on this list of professional services. It includes uh, things like graphic design, uh, marketing, grant writers got their own uh, individual exemption, a whole bunch of, of uh, licensed uh, professionals like lawyers and architects are included in the list. Uh, it's a long list that includes journalists, um, but journalists were the only professionals who speak for a living who had a limit on the amount of speech that they could do as a freelancer. So under AB5, journalists, uh, both writers and, and uh, photojournalists, were limited to 35 submissions per employer per year. And if that sounds arbitrary, it, it was. The, the, the author of AB5 admitted that it was arbitrary. Basically, the, they just wanted to put a cap on the amount of work a freelancer could do uh, in order to get rid of freelancer jobs because there was this prejudice baked into AB5 against independent contracting generally. And so journalists were stuck with this 35 submission limit, which created this incredibly uh, peculiar and unconstitutional situation where if you're a marketing professional, you've got a full exemption under AB5. So you can do freelance marketing projects all day long, writing press releases maybe. But if you're a journalist writing about those press releases, you're limited to 35 submissions per employer, per, per client per year. And what that means is you're, you're basically going to have a hard time um, working as a freelance professional because once you hit that 35 submission cap, you're done with that client. And, and there are only so many uh, folks to, to sell your writing and photography to. Um, and so that unequal treatment is a, a constitutional violation because your freedom to freelance depends on what you have to say. If you are uh, talking, uh, if, you're, if you're producing speech that is marketing, then you're, you're free to freelance. But if you're producing speech that's journalism, you've got this 35 submission limit. And the Constitution does not allow the government to regulate speech differently based on what is being said. And so that's, that's why we sued uh, to overturn that unequal treatment. There's, there's another problem with AB5 as well that's mainly a problem for the photojournalists, but, but for the writers as well. 
uh, it, it was a, in a sort of a peculiar bit of draftsmanship. AB5 ends up banning video recording for freelancers. So as a freelance photographer, you could be snapping pictures of an event and, and flip a button on your camera and start recording video. And the moment you do that, you lose the ability to freelance under AB5. And, and even writers are, are finding themselves uh, you know, writing, writing content, and then part of that contract includes taking video or, or, or shooting pictures. And so they were, they were having their ability to freelance limited by the video ban as well. Uh, and again, only journalists. Uh, were, were subject to this ban. And so for the, for the same reason as we, that we challenged the 35 submission limit, we challenged that video ban as well. Now, what is the status of uh, this lawsuit? Yeah, so we filed the lawsuit uh, even before AB5 went into effect. Uh, and and uh, at, at the end of the year, we filed the lawsuit and asked the court, uh, the, I'm sorry, at the end of, of 2019, we filed the lawsuit and asked the court to put an immediate stop to this 35 submission limit because what we were seeing already, even before AB5 went into effect in January, we were seeing uh, publications blacklisting California writers and photographers because either they didn't want to deal with having to count the number of submissions that were coming in and, and worrying about hitting the 35 submission limit, or uh, they simply couldn't manage to manage that that limit in a, in a practical way. And so they said it's easier to just not deal with California freelancers uh, than to try to deal with these complicated rules that, that California has put into place. So even to the extent that, that uh, publications looking for coverage on local California issues were, were already uh, advertising, um, even before AB5 went into effect, that they would not consider anyone from California to cover California. They wanted someone from a neighboring state to cover California. So we sued and asked the court to put an immediate stop to this. And unfortunately, the district court didn't agree with our arguments. The, the district court did not uh, understand the, um, the important constitutional violations that were taking place. And uh, so denied our request for preliminary relief and, and actually dismissed the lawsuit for the same reason. And so that lawsuit is now on appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Gotcha. I mean, I, I think what you've highlighted here, uh, and thank you for the thorough uh, explanation and background, uh, but what stands out to me is the unequal treatment of people within the same profession, but also the hardship that it imposes on individuals who are simply just trying to work on their schedule and, and, and in, their, in the manner they choose. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I'll, for our viewers and listeners out there, um, you know, it was amazing when you had Vox Media hailing the passage of AB5 as this great pro worker protection law, and then they turned around and fired, laid off 300 freelance writers. Um, and, and, and with the idea, they, they did hire on a few uh, full-time or, or full employees, but ne not nearly as many freel as freelance writers that they had um, contracted before that. And now and I think that leads to another question about what the intention or the motivation behind AB5 was. I mean, I think proponents will say, well, this is a great way to get people, workers, uh, to be hired by their employees as, as full W-2 employees with all of the benefits and all of the worker protections. Uh, do you subscribe to that position, or what do you see as the motivation? Oh, I, no, I think you're exactly right. I think that that is the motivation. You know, and, and it, it's always in policy making. it's always Baptists and bootleggers. So I, I think <laughs> there, there are some in the legislature who think, Gosh, it would be really nice if everyone had uh, a W-2 job, and and isn't that how everyone wants to work? Um, the the sponsor of the bill, uh, Lorena Gonzalez, said that these freelance jobs are not quote real jobs. Uh, you know, from their perspective, if you don't come in and punch the clock and work nine to five uh, and join the union, it's not a real job. And I think that's that's where some of the bootlegging comes in, the the self-interested policy making. Um, the, the unions aren't able to unionize uh, freelance workers very effectively, sometimes not at all. And, and so you have this coalition of, of well-meaning folks thinking that if we legislate full employment, people will be employed. And then you've got the self-interested folks on the other side thinking, gosh, that'll be a great opportunity for us to add members to our roster. And you end up with this, 
this policy stew uh, that doesn't taste very good to anybody uh, in AB5. Um, but I think there's absolutely the, the motivation for AB5 was there's one kind of way, there's one way to work. There's one kind of job that is a real good job. And, and folks who have made their careers as, as freelancers, independent contractors are, are missing out on, on that better way of working. And the response from freelancers, from freelancers, mind you, across the political spectrum, was mm-hmm. leave us alone. We do not want your help. It is not helpful. You are destroying our careers. And and I think, you know, as convoluted as this bill that was passed on Monday is, uh, it's a response to that. It, it is the legislature understanding that they've really screwed something up badly and broadly, and uh, and they're trying in, in a haphazard way to fix it, but still leaving many, many problems on the table. Well, and picking up on your point, leaving many problems on the table, I mean, is exemptions kind of, I think you had a blog post out today, a great one, fix it, this fix it bill. Is that the way to fix a law or, uh, that seems to be fundamentally broken? Or should, should this really be about repealing AB5? Yeah, absolutely. It, in, in order to fix the problem, AB5 needs to be repealed. Um, we, we can go on like this, and I imagine we will go on like this, adding more and more exemptions and creating a more and more convoluted system. If you, if you manage to uh, sit through the uh, floor session uh, the other day when, when this bill was passed, you would have seen dozens of amendments being offered for tattoo artists, for um, TV journalists who are still not included in, in any of the exemptions, uh, for franchisers and franchisees, um, for for businesses that serve other businesses, there there are were dozens of exemptions that were offered as amendments that were rejected by the majority. And so it's 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 not it's speculation to say that next session we're going to be back in the same position, adding more uh, um, exemptions to AB5 because it's a fundamentally bad policy to tell people. You must work in, in one way as, an, as a, a full employee, and anything else isn't good enough for you uh, from our perspective, the, um, from the legislature's perspective. Uh, and, and whenever you do that, you end up in a situation where, where folks who's, who, whose livelihoods are destroyed by these policies have only one choice, which is to ask for uh, their livelihood to not be destroyed, and then so on and so forth down the line. Um, there's there's a little bit of background here that kind of helps to explain what's going on here. The all of this comes out of a California Supreme Court decision called Dynamex about whether uh, contractors were being appropriately classified as independent contractors, and that's where this this test comes from that you can't be an independent contractor if you're working in the course of the hiring entity's business, and the response to that decision. From the legislature was well if we don't if we don't enact exemptions to this this new test that the, the courts put into place then everyone's going to have to be an employee it's the court's fault that we have to enact this legislation that's not true that that is the legislature abdicating its responsibility to say is this test the right one should we should we apply this test to everyone can we can we formulate a better test the legislature didn't ask any of those questions. It just took as a, as, gi- as a given this test that was created by the California Supreme Court and then decided to create all of these exemptions. And the reason they did that is what we talked about before, this, uh, this idea that if you're not a full employee, you're not a real worker and you don't have a real job. And, and in order to enact that policy preference, we ended up in this, in this mess uh, with, with AB5. You know, um, Jim, that is really great, uh, w- what you brought it back to, which is the Dynamex decision, um, the, the legislature abdicating its role, and, and really um, how it could have or should have addressed what may have been um, some 
examples of wide of, of misclassification. I have not seen um, that it, that it, those examples were anything widespread. Maybe there, maybe the bill sponsors did. Um, but I, but I think the larger point is that those issues could have been dealt with in a different way, rather than such a sweeping law that had so many. Uh, unexpected, unintended consequences. It's putting, taking food off of people's tables, literally in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, I, I appreciate you really breaking down both uh, the, uh, the the specific uh, challenges for journalists and for content creators, but also broadly how we got to where we are, uh, why we're <laughs> where we're at, and and probably what's going to happen moving forward. Is there anything you want to uh, to to leave us with? Uh, about AB5 or the work that you're doing? Well, uh, unfortunately, the work continues on this because even though the, the exemptions for journalists were broadened a little bit by, by the bill that was just passed, there is still, there's still this fundamental constitutional problem of treating journalists different from other freelancers. And then we still have the fundamental problem of, of leaving many, many independent contractors out in the cold and without an exemption from this bill. Uh, and so both the litigation and uh, the lobbying are going to have to continue until we end up with a better policy solution where, where, where we recognize the dignity of individuals to choose their own type of work, choose their own way to organize their, their business. Um, and AB5 just fundamentally doesn't do that. And so until we get full repeal, we'll, we'll still be fighting in the courts and, and fighting in the legislature uh, for uh, recognition of, of the dignity of, of freelance work. Very good. And you know what? We are right there alongside with you, Jim. Um, at the Independent Women's Forum, actually, we have a storytelling campaign called Chasing Work, where um, we have been interviewing independent contractors, you know, men and women from um, transcriptionists to HR professionals, people who, you know, have seen their livelihoods literally disappear um, because of this law. And that's even before the pandemic hit and, and uh, work became even more elusive. So, you know, I, I think all of these efforts, the, the legal efforts, um, the legislative efforts, um, the storytelling um, efforts are, are important to raise awareness um, and very big kudos to all of those freelance organizations um, that are getting the message out um, so that the legislature actually hears that, you know, this is bad policy and, you know, exemptions upon exemptions is not the, is not going to deal with a, a, a law that's fundamentally flawed. So Jim, thank you so much for your time today for joining us on She Thinks. Uh, to our listeners, we hope that you enjoyed this episode uh, and the podcast in general. If you do enjoy listening, we'd love it if you could take a moment and leave us a rating on uh, or a review on iTunes. That really ensures that our message reaches as many people as possible. Please share this episode. Let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes on their favorite podcast app. So from all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening.